Since their emergence over 200,000 years ago, modern humans have established homes and communities all over the planet, but they didn't do it alone. Whatever corner of the globe you find Homo sapiens in today, you're likely to find another species nearby, Canis lupus familiaris. Whether they're herding, hunting, sledding, or slouching, the sheer variety of domestic dogs is staggering. But what makes the story of man's best friend so surprising is that they all evolved from a creature often seen as one of our oldest rivals, Canis lupus, or the gray wolf. David, so while dogs have helped humans survive in human history, I want to start left field and talk about it in a modern sense and why you believe dogs might actually have a mental health benefit for the modern human. It seems like there are a lot of research and studies talking about dogs and uh, lowering anxiety and making us happier in general. So before we move into the past, I just want to talk about a modern sense. Why, why do you think dogs seem to make us happier? It's a great question, man. Um, I'd say it's twofold. One, we, uh, when dogs and humans interact, you get uh, a chemical release in the brain of oxytocin. Um, and that is the chemical that releases when like, you know, apes and, uh, the humans like, you know, breastfeed their children. When you like, look at your baby, it like, it bonds you physically. So, uh, we get that from our dogs. Um, it's debated. I think we get it from cats as well as to if it's because of the fact that we've bred them to look like human babies or it just, you know, it's just co-evolution. Um, but the other answer I would have is that dogs are like this intermediary link between the natural world and the human world we've created. So they're a remnant artifact, if you will, of like the ice age that like we have in our homes. So even if you've never set foot, you know, gone camping, if you're from Brooklyn or Queens or something, or, you know, downtown London, you've, uh, you have a dog, which connects you to like the natural world. So uh, now I want to start wide with you and your history. The field you're in is very, very unique. And a lot of people love to hear you speak because we don't get to hear these conversations very often. So what starts you in this field of research? Was it what you wanted to do as a kid or were other factors at play? Yeah, um, always wanted to do science of some sort. Uh, I loved history as a kid. Grew up watching Bill Nye and you know Mythbusters and stuff. And uh yeah, I got really into history, went to college for it, and then realized quickly that I wasn't necessarily interested in, you know, reading history books about like different periods of time, but I was really interested in like the Spanish and indigenous contact period. And I thought it was just because of, you know, cool, you know, like conquistador kind of stuff. But then uh, really what it was, was the, the clashing of cultures. You have an iron, steel age, gunpowder age culture clashing with the stone age culture and loved that and then i took an anthropology class and realized that that's specifically what you're studying is human cultures and prehistory and things and rolled into that and i always loved dogs as a kid and a professor was pretty big on i think i posted about this the other day the relationship humans have with dogs um, in the past and i just got fascinated by that and here we are i would guess the answer is yes but do you have a dog or multiple dogs or pets um I do have a dog. He's outside sleeping right now. Um, but he, he chooses to sleep outside. Uh, yeah, I have a dog. i uh, had him my whole life. I think I had a beagle first, and then a, a lab, and then now a German Shepherd. Yeah. So going wide, thinking in a historic sense, they say, you know, dogs are man's best friend, but dogs are really Homo sapiens' best friend and a, a key to our survival. So I don't know how you typically start but maybe let's have the conversation with how important dogs and wolves were for humans very, very early on. It's a very big question. Yeah. Um, uh, it wasn't until late prehistory that uh, we, you know, came into contact with what we know as dogs. Um, the Upper Paleolithic is how I describe it. So the, the late Upper Stone Age, uh, about 20,000 years ago is when we see the first dogs genetically. Um, but what it is, man, is like humans leave Africa and they go all the way down to Australia, up to Siberia, up to Europe. Um, and, you know, indigenous Americans eventually become what the people who walked over into the Americas. 
uh, and a select group up in Siberia got trapped there by you know climate and glaciation and things. And the wolves there and the people, and this goes for all of Eurasia, are extremely similar creatures. We socialize, we're monogamous uh, to an extent, and uh, we have like a social dynamic. Uh, and also we hunt the same prey. We both really like reindeer back in the day. <laughs> um, so humans stuck in that area in Siberia would have had to co-adapt with wolves, and wolves had to get used to Homo sapiens living there as an invasive species and co-adapt. So these wolves just realized over time, like, these humans are going to beat us to the kill every time. So let's just steal food from their camps kind of thing. Or the humans fed the wolves to keep them from, you know, biting them. Uh, and generations after generations of that happening, just the Darwinian process, you have dogs and it's debated as to if this happened in multiple areas, because genetics kind of point to that. But the major, I'd say, evidence right now comes for 20,000 years ago in Siberia. As I was doing a bit of research for our conversation, I want to know if it was accurate that because there are packs of wolves, this started out with lone wolves or wolves that were removed from their packs. Those were the ones that were more open and humans felt more comfortable with. Is that is there some accuracy to say that uh, it was the lone wolf that slowly wandered towards humans and were accepted? Yeah, and this is a great example of uh, it's not necessarily survival of the fittest; it's survival of the most fit. So, uh, like we hear survival of the fittest because that that's the case. If you can fit your environment, you'll survive. But in the case of this, it's a great example because the fittest wolves that work together as a pack didn't necessarily need to scavenge. They could just do their thing, and they're the most fit in that sense. But the lone wolves, um, there's this idea of like you know alpha males and stuff like that. But the, the lone wolves are a thing. Uh, alpha males is kind of up in the air. But um, these lone wolves would have been without a pack, looking for a new one, or they were pushed out of theirs. And they realized like, okay, it's just one of me. These humans aren't afraid of that. I can just meander into camp and steal something, and they'll throw me food and call me Max or something over time. Um, and then that is the most fit uh, in that scenario. So we have, um, I guess to make this brief, you have dogs are an evolutionary niche of wolves. So the early domesticated dogs, very early on, did they have a complex and confusing relationship with the wild wolves? Did they recognize that there was similarities, that these guys were brothers, cousins, they were, that there was just generational gaps? Was there a complex relationship with early domesticated dogs with humans and the wildest wolves out there? It's a great question, actually. The closest answer I could give you is, uh, if you're familiar with Pokemon, I'm sure half the audience would be, <laughs> in Pokemon, things evolve overnight, like they just switch into something. And in, in Darwinian Earth evolution, obviously not the case. So... At 20,000 years ago, when we see dogs, what happens at 21,000 years ago? Does it just, you know, do they just birth a dog the next day? Like, we wouldn't just birth, we're not birthed from a previous hominid the next day. So what happens is you find these skulls at archaeological sites all over Eurasia of skulls that look like dogs, but they're probably wolves. Or they look like wolves, but it might be a dog. And you have to compare that with others. And, you know, in the modern day, if we find a dog at a site, you look at it, it's a dog. It's got the morphed skull. Um, but back then, it's hard to tell. So this is called the, the proto-dog period, or what I would call it. And you have essentially just wolves that are friendly. You have tame wolves. Uh, wow. And archaeologically, you're not going to see dogs then. So I would say there was a... That's a good question. There'd be intermixing like that. That's a, a very interesting th thing to say, that, oh, they were actually just friendly wolves at one point. And... Of course, this didn't happen overnight. Is there an estimate of the length of time between wolves being aggressive towards humans and something that looks and feels and clearly is a humble domesticated dog? Is there an estimate on that time frame and progress? I have an opinion on it, and then there's the fact, and the fact would be we don't know anything until 20,000 years ago, like genetically, when we compare the DNA that's where that split was. Um, but in my opinion, it was probably going on for longer than that. 
that's just one of the strongest DNA evidences there for us to compare to. So I would say it took a very long time, um, and it could have been happening for you know upwards of 100,000 years, not just 20. But um, it's hard to say because of those skulls that we find. And uh, the, if you know what the Siberian fox experiment is, which I think I've talked about before, um, or not today, I guess. Uh, it's a Soviet geneticist bred these foxes uh, to be more tame so they could farm them better. And in like, I think 13 generations, they bred the foxes enough that they had spotted coats, floppy ears, their tails wagged, and they like liked humans. Um, wow. They weren't as skittish or scared. Yeah, so it, when a controlled setting, you can do it that quickly. And there's arguments that that's not a great scenario. But um, in prehistory, we don't know how long it took because they weren't selecting for it. In terms of human survival and the thriving of humans, what are some of the tactical advantages we had once we started domesticating dogs? What are a few key advantages for our survival? I assume hunting and security are two big glaring ones, but are there a few others? Uh, I'll do it by asking this question. Um, the listeners and for you, can you identify what items are in your trash can right now just by scent? Absolutely not. Nah. So a dog and a wolf by extent can literally smell like we can see different colors and objects in you know in front of us that's our primate brain from swinging from trees and things they don't see that way but they can smell exactly what items are in that trash can and if they could speak they tell you what they were and they see the world that way so i believe ancient hunters probably had a much more keen sense of smell especially if you're outside all day and it's a couple of thousand years ago but um, you now have an animal that can smell all that. Uh, it's another sense that we don't have. Um, they can hear things way before we can. They can sense like earthquakes and things. And um, they also can ward off predators at night. Um, there's no like tactical proof of that, but we can just extrapolate that if you're tying wolves up around your camp, nothing's really going to come into camp. <laughs> Is there any evidence or any guesses on how this primitive training process happened was it just i'm gonna throw food here and you're gonna know that we're friendly we're not gonna attack is there any evidence in in written history or in in legends explaining how exactly we calmed such a wild animal to to get so close it's a great the way you phrase it at the end is good um so the the first answer i would say it's just pavlovian science like they would have known I feed it, it doesn't bite me. Like, don't bite the hand it feeds you kind of thing. Um, and over time, they would know that this was like a reciprocal process. Um, it hangs around camp, protects you, it sniffs things out for you, brings you dead rabbits and things. And um, that was probably just like, in the sense of like, you know, ancient humans communing with animals, that would be the language. They spoke through food and they would have learned that. Um, but in terms of like legends and things, an interesting just common thing around the world is that dogs, we think of Fenrir, Anubis, uh, the black dogs in um, Mesoamerican mythology and, and Cerberus, or Cerberus, I guess, they all have to do with death. Um, so there must have been some thing back then in human psyche that was associated with death. So that maybe they were finding decaying carcasses and that led us to finding them or things like, I don't know, but it, it's there. It's interesting the credit we give to certain inventors uh, that that have came up with technologies in human history. These, you know, the light bulb, or even beyond writing the the spear. But it, whoever had the bold idea of, hey, maybe we should work with this thing, that is a highly underrated uh, inventor. That is a very big technology, and I wonder who that was or whereabouts that happened. Yeah. Um, you mean just dogs in general? Yeah, the moment the moment somebody, a human, said instead of being aggressive towards this thing, let's try a different strategy. That the strategy shift of one human is almost a, a technological advancement that sparked this, right? Yeah, that, that's a. I like that. <laughs> that's cool to think about. So, is this Homo sapien exclusive, or did Neanderthals? also have this relationship with with wolves or is this the homo a uh, homo sapien advantage uh there's a book called the invaders by dr pat shipman and she proposes that 
uh, dogs or humans and dogs working together are what helped drive Neanderthal population out um, and like allowed humans to, I guess if you look at a risk game board, like Homo sapiens come in and just take up the um, the Homo or the Neanderthals that were there, and um, that gets into the whole like they didn't necessarily go extinct. We just bred with them so much that they're part of us. Um, and there's a debate as to if that is the case. That laying it out in theory is, I think, totally plausible. It's just that we don't. Neanderthals died out about forty thousand years ago. The first evidence for dogs we have is only 20 in hard evidence. So when I stated that opinion earlier that it could have been happening way longer before that, there's nothing, nothing saying that humans coming into those areas didn't have those proto-dog-like things following around camp and also now being more prone to attack Neanderthals and things. I've seen some like National Geographic or Netflix documentaries of African wild dogs like taking down like a buffalo and going after alligators what happened differently for african wild dogs or dogs that are wild in a pack what happened with them versus what happened with the dogs that that are here yeah um so african wild dogs are in lyacon pictus is their their species name and they aren't necessarily like proper dogs and like the wolf since so wolves coyotes jackals and dogs are all related um in canis and then wild dogs are a cousin of them and they are um more related to uh like the ancient breeds of um like canines that lived but it's just conversion evolution in the same sense like the thylacine in um australia wasn't a dog by any means it's a marsupial but it filled that wolf niche um, and African wild dogs are essentially like the coyotes or the like jackals of that part of the, uh, of Africa. And yeah, they they are vicious little things when you watch those videos. Yeah. Does the history of wolves becoming dogs show that this is not only possible, but likely it can happen with virtually any species that with enough time and enough generations and selective breeding, uh, a grizzly bear could turn into something that looks like a, a cute fuzzy pet. It, is that a, a very rare circumstance, the wolves to dogs, or theoretically just about any species under human aggressive conditions and under the right circumstances could essentially become a pet? In a lab setting, and like if that was the desire was to make a domestic bear, um, possibly and like a raccoon is related to a bear in that sense and they're kind of like they behave like what ancient dogs would have done they scavenge and do all that um but there's a, a general rule with domestication that it has to be an animal think of the difference between horses and zebras has to be an animal willing to breed in human captivity has to have some kind of social hierarchy where humans can you know substitute in there and um they have to be you know benevolent around humans um and wolves weren't in a sense but maybe they were back in the day and that's why we have dogs but zebras don't like people uh touching them or riding them and, and early horses we captured for their milk most likely um and when you corral those animals like goats pigs cows they and dogs clearly have no problem mating in front of us so it, it works that way but like a panda won't do it in front of people apparently i think that's just anecdotal that i know of but um, yeah, so there's the specific things that allow, oh, right, and uh, gestation period. An elephant takes 22 months to have a child um, or a baby, whereas a dog takes, I think, five to six months, something like that. I might be wrong, but shorter than us. When thinking of humans, once they hit a, a certain pivot point of luxury or abundance, I had a health expert on, and we talked about the pivot point between agriculture technology and how we needed to eat as much as possible, as fast as possible. And in 2021, the great challenge is to actually stop eating. And that just showed the pivot point in human history that things got so good. And I had a minimalist on the podcast, and I said, isn't that interesting that our great-grandparents, they wanted to innovate, create, gather as much stuff as possible, and now we're trying to figure out how to have better lives. And in this conversation, 
we had wolves turn to dogs for our survival, for our protection. At what point do humans say, actually, I want to make aesthetic changes. I actually want it to be cuter. Is there a time frame where we just uh, we start getting to the aesthetics and the luxury of dog breeding? Yeah. Um, Neolithic or post-Neolithic, so about 10,000 years ago, the end of the Ice Age, we start farming. Um, and at that point, you have division of labor. So you have people that are specifically stone crafters, you have farmers, you have goat herders and things. And um, not everyone had to do the same task every day of hunting and gathering. But around then, you're start, you're going to start to get like a kennel master who probably breeds dogs to do more herding, some to do more hunting. Um, in ancient Egypt and like the Middle East, they had the Saluki and the Greyhound type dog for racing and chasing rabbits and things. And uh, ancient China, they had all those like you know, Shih Tzus and um, Sharpays and things like that. So I would say definitely after the Neolithic, um, so 10,000 years on, it was happening, but it wasn't until like the Victorian period where you start seeing like very changes, like a lot more change in the dogs with like teacup dogs. And um, about that time would be Chihuahuas in Mesoamerica and things. And um, and yeah, Chihuahuas were bred to be... Uh, like essentially heating pads for people's knees and arthritis and stuff and you have specialized like it's a biotechnology really it's cool. is it safe to say and accurate you hear this a lot that the smaller the dog or the the cuteness breeding actually leads to a measurable significant increase in health problems that they in fact sh- should be closer to their wolf ancestors in terms of look and size and that the aesthetic breeding actually comes with health concerns yeah, I mean, it's just yeah. visibly you can see like pugs and other little dogs like that are like, struggling to breathe in a lot of ways because they used to have a very elongated snout that is now pushed in. Um, I'm never a person that's like, don't, you know, don't adopt those dogs or anything like that. I mean, I would prefer we didn't perpetuate dogs that struggle to breathe and stuff like that. But I mean, if they're alive, adopt them and love them kind of thing. But um, the, uh, like dachshunds, very long, meant to go into burrows and things like that. They have back issues. Um, German shepherds are prone to hip dysplasia, um, but they're a very wolf-looking dog too. So it's just, you know, a genetic mess all around. Do you have a, an ethical opinion on the breeding of like pugs and whatnot? Because personally, I've always thought pugs and Frenchies are like the cutest dogs ever. But in the back of my head, and the reason I haven't gotten one is because they, it does look like they're struggling to breathe. Do you do you have a, an ethical stance on on breeding in the future? Of course, take away the ones that are alive and well today. Overall, I think we should have less dogs. Um, there's uh, cats too. Cats are destroying the environment all over the world. Um, I love cats. I love dogs, but like, just like people, there's way too much of us now for the carrying capacity of the earth. Um, and dogs are something we could definitely control. Um, and in that case, like we don't need to keep perpetuating, um, pugs and little, what are the other, I forget what they're called, but the little tiny things, um, uh, was it Pomeranians and like that, uh, I think Pomeranians can breed just fine, but there's several breeds. I can't think of the names off the head that, yeah, I don't think we need to keep perpetuating that. Uh, we have plenty of other dogs and other breeds, and like I get that it's people's culture to you know have those dogs and things like that. But if that would phase out, I think I don't have any ethical concern to saying like I would rather we didn't do that. For someone that is interested in doing a job like yours, what is the best part of your job, and do you have a highlight of your career? Some some bit of research or a moment that you're proud of? Uh, in terms of just yeah. anthropology in general, yeah. Um, I would say we were digging at a site in, uh, Wyoming and it was a, a mast or a mammoth kill. Um, the Clovis people, so about 11, 13,000 years ago, killed a mammoth, uh, in Wyoming in a riverbed. Um, and we don't know if it was stuck or they, they corralled it in there, but it was a juvenile, killed it, butchered it. And there's a huge campsite around it where they were processing the skins and the, you know, taking its meat and hides and stuff. And uh, we're out there digging and trying to find evidence of this wasn't just a natural death. It was, or scavenged, it was humans doing it. And uh, digging, and we found, uh, the year before I was there, they found a chopper 
which is a big rock that you use to break bones with. Um, did some DNA testing on it, and the closest match was a modern elephant, so we know it was used for that. And then the next year, we went out there digging, and they found a spearhead uh, in the ground, and that's like direct evidence, and it had the blood residue on it for that, and um, it's just one of those days where you're out there in the sun, in the desert, in Wyoming, like, just beating down on you in the sun, and like, one day they're like, Clovis Point, and everyone screams, and you drop what you're doing and run, and then we're like, let's get drunk, and like, just, it's just one of those days where it's like, this is why I love what I'm doing, and uh, as a quick note too, just any day I post something or put a video out where someone says I didn't know that, or like, I, that's really cool. That makes my day. I always wondered what happens when you get that call that something was found. Like, how do you guys, do you rush out there? Is it logistical? Now you have to make a travel arrangement. I always wonder when there's a big find and someone like you has to get out there, what is your first order of business? And is it typically kind of frantic? Yeah, it depends on where you're digging. If it's private land, um, you can take your time getting out there. But um, federal land, state land, um, especially if it is an indigenous American, uh, you know, human remains or any kind of funerary object with that, there's a law called NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And that essentially gives back to, you know, the indigenous communities that have been pretty wronged in our country's history. Um, and if you find an indigenous American you know, skeletal remains, you consult the tribes, bring them out there and ask them what they want to do with the remains and things because it's their direct ancestors. And um, there's that. But in, uh, in other cases, the easiest way to find sites is like a farmer calls and he's like, got a bunch of airheads back here. And you're like, you'll call and go out there and check it out. Um, and pipelines and buildings, uh, they're putting it through. And actually your tax dollars pay for um, archaeology. That is what I used to do. Anything like you think of natural resources like oil and endangered species. If something is built, uh, they also have to send in archaeologists to check to make sure there aren't remains like that or there aren't huge sites. And uh, out west in Wyoming, where I was digging a lot of projects, like they were putting a pipeline in, so they'd send us out to look, and we had just found site after site, and it was like Shoshone villages and things, and you got to mark it. So they either reroute the pipeline or just cancel it altogether. And that's where you get like the Dakota Access Pipeline or the the uh, what was what's the other one? Um, the big one like that. Anyway, you mentioned finding blood residue. Is this a modern technology that that we can find like ancient items and figure out what blood and DNA or like like how how does one find blood residue and get accurate readings on such old stuff? Is this a relatively new technology and is it accurate enough? To my like superficial knowledge of it, like I leave that to my like, nerdier friends that do the lab kind of stuff. But there's lipids in the in the stone, like when it you know if you, a human cuts their hand on it, there's human blood on it, or you're butchering a mammoth. There's like little fat cells that are left in like the crevices and cracks of the stone, uh, and you send that off to a lab, and often you can get DNA from that, um, or you get um, like just the fats that are there. You put it into like essentially a big lab and database and it will run and say like 98% match with elk or deer. When you guys get a call and start digging, is that always based on a tip? It's a farmer, it's something was found randomly, or do you guys, uh, you know, look at Google Maps and, and have estimations or that's like finding a needle in a haystack, you guys wait on a, a human tip? It depends on where. Uh, I would say half the time it is someone just finds it. Like that mastodon was eroding out of, or mammoth was eroding out of the riverbank. We saw the bones, or the farmer did. So he called us in the 80s. Or I wasn't, I wasn't alive yet, but they called the archaeologists in the 80s to check it out. Um, and then we went back and dug it later. But uh, yeah, and, and most of the time it's like Walmart wants to build a new area, their new building. They got to call us and, and biologists and stuff to look at the land. And that's where you find something and then construction gets delayed and there's a huge big dig there or um yeah there's another way i worked on a military base out there and they own all the property so they just told hired the archaeologist and contracted us to go out there and just survey their entire land looking for sites and there's just site after site uh with like early american um 
like stone tools and, and indigenous people um, up to cowboy stuff and then Oregon Trail went right through there. So it was just. So we talked about like the best parts of your job and some of the cool moments. And I'm sure a lot of listeners are going to think that this is an awesome job and super interesting and they want to do something that you do. But as we're wrapping up, I have a final question because I want to offer a balanced picture. What is the worst or the most challenging part of your job? So everyone knows it's not all fun finding mammoths. Uh, the school part, I'd say number one, it's a lot of reading, a lot of critical thinking. Uh, and secondly, uh, if you're in the government part of it, it's just monotonous government work sometimes. Um, you're not out raiding tombs and stuff. It, you're doing a lot of paperwork. Um, and lastly, it's not a very like financially advisable like profession much like most sciences are like you're not going to make you know millions of dollars unless you're a best-selling author kind of thing it's just a essentially a, a blue collar white collar job um and depending on what you do um mine luckily is like i work in a lab currently and do uh, curational stuff like i sort through artifacts and do all that so that's that's a, a nice job um but some people end up not finding one because the field's just so oversaturated and it doesn't pay well. For those who are interested in deeper learning of dog domestication, because we barely scratched the surface, is there a book that you recommend or a little bit more about your YouTube channel to wrap up? Uh, for anyone interested in anthropology in general, I would read The Fifth Beginning by Dr. Robert Kelly. It's a great introduction to just human history overall. Um, for dogs, there's no like one you know Bible on it yet, uh, but there's Dogs by Darcy Morey, um, and uh, What Is a Dog by uh, what's your name Alexander Horowitz, and there's a book that I love called The Social Dog: Behavior and Cognition. Um, I can't remember the authors, but uh, that's a great one. And in, in terms of my YouTube channel, yeah, I work with uh, I've worked with Ted. I've worked with uh, PBS, Eons, and then like my stuff is just the Instagram. I'll post things that I learn about our research, and then YouTube is kind of just silly, I guess, but like I, I try to make it informative and whatnot. 